I want to talk to you today about being lost in translation. If you're taking notes, you can just write that on your notes, lost in translation. We've been in this series really talking about mind games. How do we win them? And one of the things that I realized is mind games happen probably the most in relationships where we feel misunderstood or confused by somebody. We're like, do you want me to fix the nail in your head or do you want me to just listen to you? How many have ever felt misunderstood or you misunderstood somebody? All right, most of us in this room. How, where's the men out there that are experts at you know what women want? Like you have it all figured out. Where's the men who have no clue? Still to this day, you're with me, you're like, I still don't know. After many years of studying, I don't know what she's thinking. How many of y'all still have a hard time? You're trying to not assume. Yeah, and we need help. We need help in relationships. By the way, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a book about relationships. That God wants us to have a healthy relationship with him, but he wants us to have healthy relationships with each other. And we see in the Old Testament, the New Testament, moments where couples, families, brothers, sisters, by the way, this isn't just a message about marriage, even though that is one of the biggest relationships in the Bible, this is a message in general about relationships where mind games start to occur, where the feelings of being misunderstood, confused, what's going on, I don't know what's happening, I think I misunderstood you, where do all of these happen? So if you got a Bible, go to James chapter four, James chapter four, yes. And I was looking at how so often, scripturally, there's these moments where a, a, one of the guys who's writing the Bible kind of points out something that we all deal with. He says this, he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Okay, so this happens in all of our lives. We all get into moments where we get into heated situations relationally. And James says, what, what's causing the fights and quarrels among you? We could stop right there and we could begin to dissect this. One of the reasons that I think most of us have disagreements, arguments, misunderstandings, is because we're trying to speak a language that not all of us fully understand. The, the, language, the language that you and I were born with, uh, the language that we learned from our parents, most of us in this room speak English, but, but the language that, that we have to learn later on in life, like I had to study Spanish in school, it's hard, it takes time, it takes work. There was a season where I thought I had figured out Spanish and our church took a mission trip, we went to Peru, and I was like, I'm gonna test out this language that I've got. And uh, there was definitely you know, language barriers, but I was like, I've been studying Spanish, I think I got this. So I had a, a translator with me, an interpreter, and um, we were doing a big crusade outdoors, and that earlier that morning we did a youth pastors conference with all these youth leaders that were single. And they asked me to speak on purity. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And I, I told the translator, I was like, let me take the first couple minutes, I got this. Let me, I, let me test out some of my Spanish. So he looks at me, he's like, okay. He's like, you sure? I was like, I got this. There's a couple thousand people there. So I get up in front of them and I was like, hola. And they were like, hola. And I was like, Man, uh, mi nombre es Pablo. And they were like, Pablo, you know, that my name is Paul. I was like, this is going good. I looked at the translator, I was like, yeah, I got this. He was like, all right, you know, go for it. So I was excited to be there, and so that was my next line. I was like, yo es muy, muy excitado. And um, I thought I was saying I'm excited por la noche, like for tonight, for this evening. But the translator looks at me and people start laughing, people start getting up, shaking their heads, walking out. He's like, you just told them you were sexually excited to be here tonight. <laughs> And he's like, this is a purity conference, bro. You just botched the purity conference. I was like, oh gosh. And I was embarrassed. So I go, yo es muy, muy embarazado. And he was like, you just told them you were pregnant. That's not embarrassed. Like you, you, you are totally messing this up. Just let me speak Spanish for you. Have you, ever, have you ever messed up like a moment where you just put your foot in your mouth? You're like, I shouldn't have said that. I didn't mean to say that. And, and this is, James is saying, why, why do we get into arguments? Why do we get into misunderstandings? Because we're not always saying what we mean to say, and we're not always being understood in what we're trying to say. He says this, you, you get into these quarrels and these fights because of the battles and the desires that rage within you. So I, I'll never forget, I was at this marriage conference with Ashley, and, and um, there was a guy speaking about the, the, the desires and the thoughts and the feelings and the language that sits inside of men's brains and women's brains. And he was contrasting between both the man brain and the woman brain. And so 
I thought I would talk a little bit about some of the things he shared because it was really interesting. He said, men, we compartmentalize everything. We have boxes in our brains, small boxes, not small brains. We have small boxes in our big brains. We got big brains, okay? Um, (laughs) And so he said, we have these boxes and the rule with the boxes is they can't touch each other. Like the boxes, everything that's in that box stays in that box. It is not connected to another box. It is totally just in that box. So we have a box for work. And that is, that is the work box. If you want to talk about work, we will carefully open the box, talk about work. We have a box for our relationship with our spouse. That is the box we talk about what's, what's then we have a box for like sports. We're going to talk about sports. We have a box for children. We have, we're going to talk about children. We have a box for health. We want to talk about health, but the boxes are all separated. They're, they're organized. They're separated. They're not connected. Help me in Jesus name. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm not the guy that said it, but he said this. He said, women's brains are different. They're more, it's like a big ball of wire. It's like everything's connected. And, and by the way, women's brains are, are amazing. They're strong. They're just as big as a man's brain. And, and, uh, don't, don't like, don't come at me over any of the details that I say in this sermon. But he said that, 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 that everything's connected, right? There's wires and and it's always thinking. Men's brains are not always thinking. (laughs) Women's brains are thinking a lot more than men's brains are thinking. We actually have a box called the nothing box. (laughs) It is a real box. Y'all think it doesn't exist. It is a real box. Men, can you just attest with me? There is a nothing box in there. This is our favorite box. We go to this box at least once a day, a couple times a day. Some of y'all are in this box right now. (laughs) Tune in, Tokyo. I need you to be with me. Uh... But this box, when you ask us what's on our mind and we go, nothing, we really mean it. Like it, <laughs> this is why we could play a game, a video game or a game on our phone for hours. And they're like, what do you think about it? Nothing, just nothing, nothing. And, 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 and women want to come in the nothing box. They want to like add to it. They're like, this could really use some decorations and stuff. It's like, no, I don't need anything. This is my nothing box. Don't, don't tell me to add anything in here. Men could play golf. I went outside when my kids were shooting hoops the other day, my boys, I was like, what do y'all think about it? nothing? It starts at a young age, just shooting hoops, just thinking nothing. Nothing's on our mind. Women don't have that box because they're thinking about things. Right? They're always thinking about stuff and, and, and everything's connected. Our first year of marriage, Ashton and I are celebrating 15 years of marriage and I love her. She's incredible. My better half. Um, but our first year of marriage, she asked me to go get some milk. She was like, hey, I need you to run and get some milk. Make sure you get the right milk, organic milk from Whole Foods, you know, like the healthy, good milk. And in my head, I was like, I grew up on skim milk. My mom always got a skim milk and it was always Sam's choice. Great, great value at Walmart. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get my kind of milk. So I went to the store. I did not go where she asked me to go um, because I thought I knew what kind of milk we needed. I was like, I know better. I could save us five bucks. Whole Foods is expensive. I was like, I'm going to save us five bucks. I'm going to get the cheap, like $1.29. Y'all remember when milk was like $1.29? I sound like an old guy here. (laughs) <laughs> everything's just so high these days. But I was like, I'm going to go down. So I got some skim milk. It was the cheapest milk. Well, I don't even care what's in it. I, like it probably isn't real milk, but I just bought it. <laughs> and it may not be the healthiest thing. I bring it home. And she was like, I thought I asked you to get the organic milk. I was like, well, I decided it was better if we got the skim milk. And she was like, okay. Now, the milk has its own box in my head. It is only about the milk. But for her, the milk was connected to everything. She was like, this reminds me of a conversation we had a month ago. I was like, a month ago? I don't remember anything. I don't remember anything from a month ago. And like, that's, that's gone. I have no clue what happened a month ago. And she was like, yeah, when you didn't listen to me a month ago. Two weeks ago, when we were watching the football game and I was trying to get your attention, everything's connected. So then I start getting frustrated. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I grew up on skim milk. I know what kind of milk. I, I know how to make milk. And she was like, you know how to make milk? I was like, okay, maybe I don't know. And I just started going crazy, right? And it turned into a quarrel fight. How many of y'all have ever gotten into a fight and you're not even sure how it all started, but you're like, what? What, what just happened here? Okay. And by the way, it doesn't just happen with spouses. It can happen in families. It can happen at work. It can happen between friends where we get into these quarrels and fights and we're misunderstanding each other. And James says this, don't these battles start from within? 
One of the first things we need to learn about these moments where we feel lost in translation and we're not speaking the right language and we're not understanding each other is that we need to look inward first. That maybe this misunderstanding, maybe this moment of frustration, maybe this quarrel, this fight that we're in, maybe I need to start with me first. Before I start shouting at you, before I start asking you to change your milk preference, before I start getting into an argument with you, maybe I need to look inward first. James says, doesn't it start from the battles within? That somewhere there's a battle in there. Communication is the currency of relationships. If we're going to have healthy relationships, we've gotta learn how to communicate, and you can't communicate from a place of, really, from a place of complete, like, irrational thinking. One of the best ways to pause ourselves from saying stuff that we don't mean to say is first going, maybe there's something in me that's off. Maybe there's something in me that needs worked on. Maybe there's something in my own life that's not right here. Maybe there's something in my heart, my emotion. Maybe I'm taking out on her something that I need to first go to God about. And this is what James goes on to say in the same same chapter, verse two, he says, you want something that you're not getting. You demand something in a relationship that you're not getting. So you want him to listen to you. You want her to respect you. You want him to love you. You want her to love you. You want this relationship. You want more time. You want more thoughtfulness. Whatever it is, he says, you want something and you don't get it. And when you don't get it, you kill. Now, that's pretty intense. And we may not kill physically like Cain killed Abel. We may not kill physically like Joseph's brothers thought about killing him. But we kill with our words. And we begin to assassinate people with words. By the way, words carry so much power. Words can make or break a relationship. So much of our relationships hinges on the words we're speaking or the words we're not speaking that we should be speaking. I remember going to this conference many years ago, the same marriage conference, and there was a man named Dr. Gary Chapman that spoke. And he talked about five love languages. And he wrote this book and he said, I sat with couples for years and years, not just husbands and wives, but he said, I would sit with boyfriends, girlfriends. I would sit with people who were engaged. He said, then I would sit even with parents and and, and their children and the misunderstandings and the broken relationships that would happen. And he said, I started circling certain trending sentences that just kept on popping up in all these conversations. Conversations like, I don't feel loved, I don't feel listened to, I don't feel understood, I feel completely ignored in this relationship, I feel completely um, forgotten, I feel like they're not even thinking about me. And then he would, he would probe into those thoughts and he would say, why do you feel that? And he said, I started noticing five specific languages that would fit into these love languages. So I wanna change the title and that's learning the language of love. That God doesn't want us lost in translation, he wants us learning this language of love. And he said, I I started writing down these five love languages that I discovered as I was listening to couples who were in fights, families that were in fights, and where they felt like their spouse, their parent, their son, their daughter, their brother, their sister, their best friend was completely misunderstanding them. And, And these were the love languages he came to. The first love language that people feel is physical touch, showing and receiving love through affirmative touching. How many of y'all, this is your number one love language right here. You're like, just give me a big hug, cuddle with me. If you're married, sex, whatever it is, but you're like physical touch, holding hands. This is like, I feel loved in this moment. The second love language is quality time. This is my wife's top love language, meaningful time with your partner. Some of y'all are like, I'm all five love languages. I want all five all the time. Okay. But meaningful time with your partner, phone down. Eyes locked in, getting out of the nothing box, talking about stuff, right? Chatting over dinner, going for a long walk, quality time. Brian Dyson, the CEO of Coca-Cola, he said, imagine life as a game in which you are juggling six balls in the air, work, home, family, your health, friendships, and your spirit, man. Everything is made of glass except work. In other words, work is the one ball you can drop that won't shatter. But if you drop family, if you drop marriage, if you drop your health, and he said, we've got to be careful that we're spending time on the things that matter the most. The third love language is words of affirmation. This is my top one right here. Just tell me I'm doing a good job. <laughs> like, tell me, tell me I, I preached a better sermon than last week. You're getting better, Paul, every week. I don't know if that's a compliment or a diss. Um, Feeling or showing love through compliments, through kind words, verbal expressions of love. 
How many of y'all, that's your, that's your love language right there, words of affirmation. You're like, just, just give me some compliments this week. If that's you, if you just raised your hand and you're sitting next to someone that just raised their hand, just turn and say something nice to them. You could just make their day right now. Just tell them how much you appreciate them for a second, okay? All right, here's the fourth love language, acts of service, acts of service, showing and feeling love through helpful actions such as cooking a meal uh, for somebody, cleaning their car, doing their laundry. How many of y'all, this is your love language, acts of service. You're like, serve me. I love it. Yes. <laughs> My mom, she's really good at doing this. She expresses her love for us through acts of service, and she'll call and say, hey, do you have an, any extra laundry I can do for you and Ashley? Is there anything I can do for y'all? And these acts of service are so meaningful, so important to somebody who, who loves to show this but also loves to receive this. Here's the fifth one, receiving gifts. How many of y'all, this is yours right here, like receiving a good, thoughtful gift. Some of y'all have been raising your hands on each one I've asked. You're like, number one, number one, number one. <laughs> I love them all. I love, I love to feel loved. We all love to feel loved, but we all got to learn how to love each other better. It's not just about what I want. It's about what I can give to the people around me. So James, he says this. He says, you want something you're not getting, and so you kill And then he says, you covet what you cannot get. You don't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight with each other. So I don't feel like you're spending enough quality time with me. I don't feel like you're touching me enough, you know? I don't feel like you're listening to me. I feel like you didn't think about this at all, and you didn't process it. He probably didn't think about it. I've been there before. We just went to the nothing box, right? And in these quarrels and fights, James says this, you're not getting what you want because you don't ask God. Look at that in verse 2. He says, you're not asking God. James says, before we try to squeeze out of our friend, our spouse, our parents, our children, before we try to squeeze out of a human what only God can give, maybe we should go to God first. So when I look inward first and go, what is it in me that needs to change before I demand something from them? James says, then you go to God and go, God, I'm trying to feel loved and respected and understood. I'm trying to feel valuable. I'm trying to feel important. I feel forgotten here, God says, come to me. Come to me with every need, every care, every burden. But then James says this in verse three. He says, he says, when you ask God, you don't receive what you want because you ask with wrong motives. You're asking God to either change a person, fix a person, get the nail out of her head, right? Fix this situation. God, change them, change her, change him, God says, you come and you ask me these demands and these questions and you ask for something you want, but you're asking to spend on your own pleasures. In other words, he says, you're not asking for my kingdom to come. You're not asking for my will to be done. You're asking for your will to be done. You're asking for them to do what you want them to do rather than asking them and asking God to really work on the inside of you and them. So James says, look inward first. Go to God before you go to people. Go to God before you send that email to your boss. Go to God before you text her. Go to God before you scream. Go to God before you shout. And I know this is hard because in the middle of the heat, it is like I'm not thinking like I need to go to God. I'm so angry right now. (laughs) I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you. But then James says, be the first to humble yourself. In that same chapter, James 4, verse 6, he says, God gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. This is what Pastor Bill Johnson was talking to me a couple weeks ago at our conference. He said, never miss a chance to die, Paul. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's gonna be opportunities and relationships to die, and you should die. I was like, but if I die, how am I supposed to live? He's like, you can't fully live until you die. I was like, Mr. Miyagi, I need you to explain this to me. Yoda, stop talking in riddles. And what he meant was something Jimmy Evans said, the same thing in in his marriage conference. He said, marriage will kill you. And it should, because if it doesn't, you'll kill it. He said, it it, it needs to kill the selfish side of you. Not just marriage, but parenting, relationships in general. That somewhere in our relationships, if we're going to really thrive, if we're going to really see healed homes and healed relationships, somewhere in there, we got to die to our ego. We got to die to the entitlement generation that demands, I'm not feeling loved or celebrated. I'm not saying we become rug mats. I'm not saying we bow down to abuse or toxicity, 
But I am saying before we try to demand something, maybe God wants us to humble ourselves. Maybe God's saying, don't miss this chance to surrender. Don't miss this chance for me to work in you. God opposes the proud man. God opposes the proud woman, but he gives grace to the humble. And when I was looking at these five love languages, so much of this requires humility. So much of relationships working requires humility. It requires surrender. Ephesians 5, 21 says, submit yourselves mutually to God. Like God wants us to actually submit. That's a, that's a tough word. That's a misused word in, in, in our world today. It's one of those words that people have a hard time with. It's like, ee, I gotta get out of here. But submission could be a beautiful word when we bring it in the right context. And we say, Lord, teach me to humble myself. Teach me. James says submit as well. In the same chapter, says submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he has to flee from you. What does that word submit? It just means surrender. It just means humble yourself. Run to the cross. Be the first one to apologize. When I was looking at these five love languages, I realized they really fit into two categories. They fit into the category of actions, which is like gift giving, quality time. Those are actions, right? Acts of service. And then the other category is words. And words is what I want to focus on today because words can heal or destroy relationships. In the same book of James, James says the tongue has the power to start a wildfire in a forest. It's like a spark. It's like a rudder on a ship. It's small. The tongue is small, but it dictates where the body goes. It dictates where relationships go. I, I was looking at statistics of bullying. Did, did, did you know every 30 seconds someone takes their life in the world? Every 30 seconds, someone ends their life, and most of the times they said it's connected to the words that they have either listened to or heard, believed, or spoken over themselves. Words carry power over people's self-image. Words carry power over people's belief in themselves. Words carry power over relationships. And with our words, we can either breathe life into relationships, we can breathe hope, or we can breathe death. I was looking at the statistics of secondhand smoke. Children who grow up with parents who smoke all the time, regular smoking every single day, they have more tendencies to have cancer, lung cancer, respiratory problems, asthma attacks, ear infections. I mean, the list goes on. 30,000 people die a year from secondhand smoke. 30,000, just in the United States alone. 30,000 people die every year because of secondhand smoke. And I started thinking about secondhand strife. That, that what we're setting as adults, we've got children right now in children's church and we got teenagers that'll be in youth service on Wednesday night, but when they're exposed to the strife, the screaming, the cussing, the yelling, the name calling, the putting down, I wonder how much it affects, not just the person we say it to, but the people who hear it and feel it. And I'm preaching to myself here, Lord, put a watch over my tongue. Lord, put a watch, a guard over my mouth. We're either sucking life out of people with our words or we're breathing life into them with our words. And so I want to give you real quickly four ways to use your words as the language of love to breathe life into the people around you. Number one, content matters. And you might be asking, what do you mean content matters? What you say matters. What you say. What are, what are we saying with our words? Think before you speak. Have you ever heard that before? Think before you speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? That's a big one right there. Is it kind? Paul the Apostle said in Ephesians, if we have nothing wholesome to say, then we shouldn't say it at all. Use our words to build others up. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude or self-seeking. Love does not celebrate when others fall. Love does not demand from others. Love is not easily irritated. Here's what love doesn't speak. Here's the kind of content love doesn't say. You always do that, Daniel. You never do this for me, Abby. This is all your fault, Juan. You made all the mistakes here. I meant to, but I didn't do it, okay? So you just need to get over it. You need to go down to Lowe's, buy a ladder, and get over it, okay? That's not how love talks. Just forget about it, okay? Love doesn't sound like, you're such a fill in the blank, don't fill in the blank. I told you so, I told you you were wrong. If you were more like your sister, Things would be easier. This relationship would actually work. If you were more like my dad, if you were more like my mom, whatever those things are. Here's what love does say. Love says, I care about you. I care for you. Love sounds like this. I love you. Those three words could change a relationship. I love you. That's validation. 
I'm sorry, that's humility. I'm sorry, I was wrong. That's ownership. That's how love sounds. I was wrong. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I trust you. That's empowerment. Here's how love sounds. I trust you. I'm gonna trust you. I believe in you. You're doing a great job. You're doing better than you think you are. That's affirmation. You've got what it takes. That's approval. You're approving someone. You've got what it takes, son. You've got what it takes, ma'am. You've got what it takes. You can do this. You can do this. Thank you. That's appreciation. Here's, this is the language of love. I'm just giving us some words, some phrases. Here's a bonus for, for all the husbands to say to your wife. You always look beautiful. You always look beautiful. Babe, you always look beautiful. Every single Sunday. Even when I look like imperfect, you always look beautiful. Content matters. Number two, timing matters. I want the band to come out. Timing matters. Love speaks first. Pride waits, love initiates. Pride says, I'm gonna see what they say. Then I'll decide what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna wait till they apologize. Then I'll decide if I'm gonna forgive them. I'm gonna wait until they encourage me. Then I'll send a text message of encouragement. I'm gonna see if they even show up to the game before I even say anything. I'm gonna see if they do their part. That's pride. Pride always waits for someone else to do their part. But humility says, I'm gonna go first. Timing matters. First John 4, 19, God went first. We love because he first loved us. God didn't wait for us to come to him in our brokenness and our sin. He came to us first. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How many are thankful the gospel didn't wait for us to figure it out, but God came first. He went first with love. He initiated it. What if we were the first to initiate conversations of healing in relationships? Not just with your spouse, but with your son, with your daughter, with your friends. Don't wait for them to speak first. Go first. Be the first one to the cross. Be the first one to apologize. Be the first one to say, I forgive you. Be the first to say, I was wrong. Sometimes we have to calm ourselves down before we speak, though, <laughs> right? I, growing up, there would be times where I could tell my dad was getting frustrated with my mom. Here's how I knew. He would go outside and start sweeping the driveway. And there would be no leaves on the driveway. He would just start sweeping a total leafless driveway. And I'd come out there and I'd be like, what are you sweeping? He's like, the dust. I'm like, I don't see any out here. He's like, I know. I was like, what are you praying about? He's like, your mother. <laughs> like, what happened? He's like, oh, she's a mighty woman of God. You know? <laughs> and I could tell he was working through his tension. Honestly, it was good for me to see because I realized that people who think someone is perfect also has issues too in their relationships. We all do. Like we never graduate not needing to work on our relationships. Relationships take work. Loving God is pretty easy, but loving people is a test. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Especially loving the people closest to you who can offend you the most. Because you can love strangers. Like I'll go down to the soup kitchen and serve people. It's great. But what about your own family? that ticks you off, that annoys you, that makes you late, that frustrates you, that just gets on your last nerve. The real test is loving the people that are closest to us. And so we need to calm ourselves down. I had to do this with, with, with myself, uh, me and Ashley. There's been times where I just like, I just need to calm my, my emotions down. How many of y'all need to calm your emotions down sometimes in a relationship? You're like, before I speak, I just need, I need some time. I need some quietness just for a minute. I had to do this with one of our sons not too long ago. And uh, we grew up watching Daniel the Tiger, the cartoon. And he's like, when you get so mad that you want to scream, I don't know what it is, count to four, you know, one, two, three, four. And, or when you want to roar. And so we counted to four and he calmed himself down. <sighs> just breathe and then speak life. Number three, tone matters. It's not just what we say. It's not just when we say it. It's how we say it. Think about that. Say this with me, it's not what we say. It's not just when we say it, it's how we say it. Our tone, our tone matters. Proverbs 15, one says, gentle tones turns wrath away. A gentle answer, it's the gentleness in your tone. Cause you could say something, but not say it with gentleness. Like, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> We could say things, but we don't mean it. 
And, 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 or we could say it, but we could say it with a harsh tone, like, okay, all right, okay, I got it, got it, got it, yeah. But we need to speak it with a kind tone. We, the environment we, we are, are grow, that we grow up in shapes the language that we speak, the accent that we have, right? I was, I was talking to someone who spent a long time, they, they grew up in the United States, but then they went and spent like five years in Australia and they came back with a new accent. I was like, that is not real. You do not have an Australian accent. They're like, good day, mate. I was like, nope. You grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Stop faking your accent. They're like, you know, they just kept talking Australian. And I was like, okay, what happened? They're like, I spent, I spent five years there and the accent rubbed off on me. And I wonder if we could just spend some more time in the presence of God where the accent of his love begins to change our sarcasm with each other. You go, well, it's the way I was raised, Paul. I was raised sarcastic. We just sarcastically put each other down. That's how we show love. We call each other names. You know, my son knows he, that I love him when I call him an idiot, okay? But um, I just wonder, I wonder if we could save, save some people and save some relationships and save some people's mental and emotional health. And I'm not saying that we just like act very overly, you know, encouraging all the time and not speak truthful, but I'm just saying, I wonder if the enemy is using our words to destroy each other when God's trying to use our words to heal each other. Number four, attitude matters. This last point right here. Romans 12 verse nine says, um, let your love be sincere. So the attitude, did you know 57% of our communication is nonverbal? 57% of what we say is through our body language. So we could say, I love you. I forgive you. And our attitude, our body language is saying something different than our words, right? And, and so our body language is putting off a vibe of annoyance, anger, frustration. I'm ticked at you. I'm just so done with you. 57% of what we say is non verbal. It's, it's, it's body language. There was a moment in the New Testament, Acts chapter eight, a man was reading a piece of scripture that he didn't know was scripture. He was in a chariot and he was trying to understand it. And so he's in this chariot and he's reading, but he doesn't get it. He's lost in translation. And a guy named Philip, a disciple of Jesus, starts running after the chariot, catches up with the chariot, gets inside and he says, do you know what you're reading? And the, the eunuch, he says, no, I have no clue. I don't understand it. I'm lost in translation. Philip says, let me explain. It's Isaiah, the prophet. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And this, this man who's never heard the Bible before, you might be the only Bible your family reads during the week. You might be the only translation of scripture and love that someone in our city will meet. So Philip starts breaking down the translation. He starts explaining it to him. And the man says, who is this about? Philip says, it's about Jesus. He died for you. He loves you. Philip ends up leading him into salvation and healing and forgiveness. He just needed someone to translate it for him. And there's times in our life where we need someone to translate the love of God to us because we have experienced so much hurt, confusion, and pain. We need someone to remind us who we are in Christ. We need someone to bring healing in relationships where there's been pain and we've only been taught to be abandoned by people, let down by people. And so I just feel like today as we end, I wanna speak some words of love over you. I wrote, I wrote a love letter to this 11 a.m. service. Last night I was in the car, I was telling my boys that I was trying to write poems for them and for their mom and for our church and they thought it was the funniest thing ever. And so I wanna just speak this over you because I, I want you to know I mean this. 11 a.m. service, I love you so much. You are the most fun, crazy, charismatic service to be a part of every single week. You never know what's gonna happen in the 11 a.m. service. You guys make me feel so alive. When I show up to the 11 a.m. service, there's so much energy and life. You are the cream of the crop. You are a delight to be around. I love coming to the 11 a.m. service. You make me smile, you make me laugh, you make me cry. I think I experience more emotions in the 11 a.m. service than any other service during the week. You guys make me smile so much. You guys make me wanna run a mile so much. I'm trying to rhyme here. You are awesome. I've, I've been honored to sit with many of you at the altar. I've been honored to sit with you, some of you in your hospital room with family members you've lost, loved ones you've lost. 
I've been honored to get to do the weddings for some of you in this room. I've been honored to get to do funerals for family members that passed away. It's a real joy to be with you every Sunday. I look forward to it. I feel really blessed that you could choose to go to any church in our city and you come to victory. You are the most kind, loving, forgiving church. You've put up with all my hairdos, all my outfits. You've put up with all the weird seasons of my life. And I just, I wanna say thank you. Thank you for coming to victory. Thank you for being such a, an, a stellar group to do life with. Thank you to the volunteers. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to all of our church members. You're integrity-minded. You care about integrity. You care about mercy. You're mercy-minded. You're creative. I look at some of you and I'm like, you guys are so creative. What you do, how you're using your gifts for God, it's, it's amazing. It's inspiring. I'm inspired by you. You're intelligent. I meet many of you out in the lobby. I'm like, you are smarter than me. You should be up here. You know more than I know. And you know you know more than I know. You're excellent. You inspire me to dress better. I feel underdressed around y'all. I'm like, I need to sharpen myself up. Y'all are so sharp. You're patient. You are very patient because sometimes I get long-winded and y'all are like, we know, bro. But thank you. Thank you. You're generous. Because of your generosity, we're able to bless other couples, bring healing in places like Camp Victory, Victory North, Victory Manford, Tulsa Dream Center, the West Tulsa Dream Center. And I know you could say, well, it was all God, but God used you. God used you. He called you here. And I'm saying all these words because I want you to know that we need to hear these words of affirmation and we need to share them with others. We need to speak them to others. So I want you to stand your feet all over this place. I want to pray for all of us to get better at using our words to speak life using our mouth to breathe hope, to light a spark, not of strife and anger and hostility, but to light a spark of mercy and grace and forgiveness and humility and kindness. So if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes all over this room, if you're here today and God was speaking to you about continuing to learn the language of love, 1 John 4, verse seven through eight says, Dear friends, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God. He who does not love does not know God because God is love. And if you're here today and you just say, I just need to learn more of God's language of love. I need him to renew my mouth, renew my mind. I wanna use my words to speak life. I need to repent of words I've spoken over myself, over others in my family and relationships. I want God to heal some areas in my tongue where I have just been tempted to say whatever's on my mind, say whatever I'm thinking, say whatever I'm feeling. Lord, help me, God, to speak life. If that's you, just lift your hand up all over this room. God's speaking to you. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, yes. From the front to the back. In fact, if you raised your hand or you just need to get down to the altar to get right with Jesus, I want you to leave your seat. Come and join me at this altar. And we're gonna celebrate brave men, brave women. Maybe you wanna come down with your spouse. Maybe you wanna come down with your dad. Maybe you wanna come down with your mom. Maybe you wanna come down as a whole family. But I'm gonna ask us all just to honor this moment because God is doing a work. If you're here today and you say, Paul, I'm not right with Jesus. I need to repent of my sins. I need to get saved. I need to receive his forgiveness. Today is your day. Salvation is here. Come down to the altar. If you need to get right with the Lord, come down to the altar. God is calling. His mercy is here. His hope is here. If you need healing in relationships, come down to the altar. If you're praying for God to heal a relationship in your family, for your parents, for your kids, for your spouse, for your boyfriend, your girlfriend, for your kids, whatever the situation is, bring it to the altar. And I want us just to worship God. Let's just take a couple minutes right now just to sing these words. I will build my life on your love. Lord, I will build my life. God, search me and know me. Renew me, God. Purify my heart and my mind. Use my mouth, God, to speak life. Lord, help me to walk in humility. God, help me, Lord, to humble myself. God loves you so much. God cares about you so much. If you have been the victim of words that have been painful, come down to the altar. God wants to heal your heart, your mind of every word that's been spoken over you that is not from him. God says, I speak a better word over you. I speak a better word over you. God speaks a better word over your family. God says, you are loved. You are valuable. You are chosen. You are called. You are anointed. You are appointed. You are worthy of his goodness and his mercy.
If you've had some words spoken over you that have caused deep pain, mental, emotional, or even physical pain, I want you to just raise your hand. God wants to bring healing to you today. The Lord says he speaks a better word than what they said over you. God says, I have a better word than what he said about you. I have a better word than what she said about you. I have a better word than what they said over you. God's word says that he loves you. God says, I have thoughts about you and they're good thoughts. The thoughts that the Lord has, he says, they outnumber the sand on the seashore and every single thought is a good thought. God says, my plans for you are good. I have plans to give you hope and a future. I have plans to prosper you. God says, I don't look at you and see sin and shame and regrets. God says, I see the righteousness of God. I see a daughter of God. I see a son. I see a man who's more than a conqueror. I see a a mighty man of God, a mighty woman of God. God looks at you and he says, you are forgiven. You are pure. You are called. You are adopted in his family. You are predestined for greater things. Before you were ever made in your mother's womb, God says, I formed you. I created you. I don't make mistakes. God says, I don't make accidents. I don't make failures. God says, you are not a failure. You are forgiven. You are a candidate for his mercy and his grace. You are a testimony, a living, breathing testimony of God's grace. Come on, if you believe that this morning, just thank God that you are forgiven, you are loved, you are called, you are chosen. God says in Ephesians that he created us for good things. God says that he called us his own. He forgave us. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I want to invite you to say a vow with me. It's a vow of using our words to bring life. If you're willing to say this with me, just repeat this with me. I vow to speak life. I vow to use my words to build others up, to bring healing, to bring encouragement, to rebuild, to repent when I'm wrong, to forgive when others wrong me, to affirm, to honor, to speak love by the power of God's love vested in me, in Jesus' name. Now, those of you that came down today that just need to forgive and receive forgiveness, pray this with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I repent. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for purifying me, my mind, my heart, my mouth. Help me to speak life. Help me to speak love. Thank you, Jesus, for filling my heart with more of your love, your peace, your grace for others around me. I'm all yours. In Jesus' name, amen.